السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اليوم راح نحكي عن موضوع مهم كثير هو موضوع الساعة خصوصا مع جائحة الكوفيد 19 اللي هو موضوع الالتهابات الرئوية بالعربي ذات الرئة أو نيمونيا We will start by defining pneumonia which is an inflammation of the pulmonary parenchyma. Uh, the pulmonary parench uh, parenchyma is the lung substance distal to the respiratory bronchioles, as you see uh, from this um, uh, picture. Uh, this includes the alveolar ducts, the alveoli, and the interstitium between the alveoli. This inflammation can be infectious and non-infectious. You will hear terms like pneumonia and pneumonitis. They are interchangeably used, and none of them is peculiar to infectious or non-infectious causes. You can use pneumonia with infectious uh, pneumonias, as you uh, commonly do. But sometimes non-infectious causes can be also called pneumonias. Um, and uh, similar uh, to this is pneumonitis. Uh, you can uh, say pneumonia with cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, with um, uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Um, in the same way, you are using it with bacterial pneumonias. And you can say pneumonitis with infectious causes like varicella pneumonitis. In the same way, you can use um, this with radiation pneumonitis or lupus pneumonitis, which are non-infectious. And if you see uh, in this slide, there are multiple causes uh, causing the syndrome that is that can be presenting with uh, the picture of pneumonia so you have to be careful with dealing with pneumonia because uh, a lot of infectious and non-infectious causes can be uh, a cause of this syndrome and uh, one more thing if you pay attention to this point here uh, about the PCR you will notice that this slide from 2014 that coronavirus was um, known at that uh, period and even before that and uh, what's happening now is a new disease but from an old microorganism. Now from now on we will be talking about uh, the infectious pneumonias and uh, this is very important because despite being the cause of significant morbidity and mortality this pneumonia is often misdiagnosed, as you see from the lot of differential diagnosis. And if it's diagnosed appropriately, it can be underestimated and can be mistreated, even if you uh, uh, give uh, this pneumonia the uh, proper estimation, but can be mistreated. So we have to be careful. Um, now, the pathophysiology of uh, pneumonia, when it's infectious, uh, the microorganisms gain access to the lower respiratory tract in several ways. The most common is aspiration from the oropharynx, can be microaspiration, um, and it can also occur less commonly as an inhalation from the contaminated droplets. However, rarely hematogenous spread or contiguous extension from uh, an infectious focus can also uh, lead to pneumonia. And uh, the pneumonia results from the proliferation of the, the microbial pathogens that um, uh, gained access to the lower respiratory tract and the inadequate host response to those pathogens. What's important to us as clinicians is the clinical view. So pneumonia presents with a syndrome uh, that has constellation of symptoms and signs um, of lower respiratory tract infection. Those symptoms and signs can be specific respiratory uh, symptoms and signs or systemic ones. And this should be in combination with at least one opacity on chest radiography. And when we say chest radiography, we're talking about chest X-ray or CT scans. The symptoms can be specific respiratory symptoms, cough, sputum, uh, production, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain or chest pain, hemoptysis, or can be systemic and on the top of the list is fever. Uh, 
they can have rigors and chills, anorexia, fatigue, myalgias, excessive sweatings, arthralgias, uh, certain pneumonias present with rash, other pneumonias may present with extra pulmonary uh, uh, symptoms uh, like abdominal pain, diarrhea, or other GI symptoms, or with altered mental status, especially in the extremes of ages. Um, uh, and here we talk about adults and infants, uh, I mean elderly uh, adults uh, and infants. In the physical examination, you can have a lot of uh, physical findings um, depending on the way the pneumonia presents. In the vital signs, patient may have normal respiratory rate, but may be tachypneic. Um, he may have uh, normal temperature, especially if, they, uh, if he has fever that's intermittent, or he took antipyretics, but uh, usually they have fever. Uh, and uh, uh, in some instances, they can have hypothermia, and those instances usually point to a severe uh, pneumonia leading to sepsis or septic shock, as we will say, uh, I, as we will talk about later. They can be tachycardic, and this tachycardic can be multifactorial due to anxiety, due to pain, due to shortness of breath, or due to fever. The blood pressure uh, also can be normal. Um, uh, it can be elevated due to uh, the pain or the anxiety, or it can be low in severe pneumonias leading to septic shock or sepsis. Um, if the patient's having consolidation, then you will have the signs of consolidation, um, like decreased chest expansion uh, in the overlying areas, increased tactile vocal fremitus or vocal resonance, dullness to percussion. You can hear crackles or bronchial breathing sounds and sometimes egophony. But if there is no consolidation, you may not uh, uh, elicit all these symptoms. You may elicit only a few of them. Uh, if the patient have um, signs, uh, pleural effusion, uh, he can have the signs of pleural effusion. Instead of increased tactile vocal fremitus, he will have decreased tactile vocal fremitus and vocal resonance. He may have stony dull percussion and there is decreased breathing sounds. So it depends. Uh, on the uh, way pneumonia presents. What's important is uh, in pneumonia is to classify them and why we need to classify pneumonia. Uh, the question comes also how to classify pneumonias. Why to classify pneumonias? Because classification helps us in the management. Eventually we need to know what treatment and here we talk about antimicrobial therapy um, if indicated, especially in bacterial pneumonias. Uh, to help us to treat this uh, pneumonia. Uh, so uh, it's important to, to uh, find a logic way of classification that helps us in the uh, defining the treatment. And here come how to classify pneumonias. Conventionally, we used to classify pneumonias as typical uh, or atypical. We used to say that the clinical, the typical clinical presentation is mostly patients who are presenting with uh, respiratory symptoms, fever, uh, I mean cough, sputum, um, sometimes chest pain or other specific respiratory symptoms, uh, in addition to fever and some sus systemic symptoms. While the atypical presentation, usually the systemic symptoms were the predominant symptoms and the patient may have only few or um, uh, minor respiratory symptoms. However, uh, we found that there is a, um, a crossover between these two clinical presentations. The typical, the predominant organisms used to be strep pneumonia, uh, while the atypical is mycoplasma, chlamydia, and viral pneumonias. The crossover made this distinction or classification uh, um, not that much helpful. Uh, so uh, we. Um, uh, we uh, try to uh, uh, find other cause of classific other way of classification. Uh, classification according to the causative organisms or microorganisms is not helpful because initially you do not know what's uh, the microorganism that's causing this particular pneumonia. You need to wait the result of the culture, so it's not valid. Uh, 
the causative microorganism, as you know, is bacterial, mycobacterial, um, viral, fungal, parasitic uh, microorganisms. They all can cause pneumonias. Of course, the most common is bacterial and viral. So the, class the, uh, the valid qu uh, classification is to classify the pneumonia by the setting in which the patient has contracted infection because we found that there is a clustering of certain microorganisms in each setting. And if you see here that um, microorganisms causing community acquired pneumonia are different from microorganisms that um, are causing nosocomial pneumonias. We have also other types of pneumonias, the homo aspiration pneumonias and pneumonias in, in immunocompromised hosts. Uh, the major two types, the community acquired pneumonia and nosocomial pneumonias are further subdivided. We used to say healthcare uh, associated pneumonia, however, this caused um, uh, a lot of confusion was um, abolished from the uh, recent classifications. Uh, and the nosocomial pneumonias, we can have subset of nosocomial pneumonias like hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator associated pneumonia. We will con concentrate mainly on the most common type of pneumonia, which is the community acquired pneumonia. Then we will talk a little bit on uh, nosocomial and uh, aspiration pneumonias. Now, before this epidemic, COVID-19, um, uh, pneumonia used to be uh, or was the deadliest infectious disease in the United States and was the eighth leading cause of death. Uh, of course, the numbers will change because apparently uh, pneumonias that occurred with COVID-19 uh, uh, increased the number of deaths uh, and maybe uh, um, it will be the leading cause of death um, in the future um, epidemiologic studies. As you see, a lot of people uh, are diagnosed, four to five millions in the United States. 25% uh, percent of them require hospitalization. Um, the patients who present with mild level cases and they do not need hospitalization, they have low mortality rate, less than 1%. However, if the patient has pneumonia severe enough to warrant uh, hospitalization, the in-hospital mortality can be up to 12 percent. And um, uh, the one-year mortality in uh, elderly people can be greater than 40 percent. So this is very important um, uh, health problem and uh, also it has uh, a big burden on the economic status of uh, each country. So how we define pneumonia, it's a uh, community acquired pneumonia. It's an acute pneumonia in a patient who is not hospitalized or if he's hospitalized, this hospitalization is less than 48 hours. That means if you uh, present and hospitalized for some other causes like gallbladder stones, biliary colic, renal colic, and you start to have fever and you were found to have pneumonia after uh, 30 hours of hospitalization, this means that this is a community acquired pneumonia. It is not a hospital acquired pneumonia, but if the hospitalization is beyond 48 hours, um, then this may be a nosocomial pneumonia. Uh, and this is because of the incubation period. If you are talking about long-term care facilities, um, the uh, definition uh, includes that the patient should not be residing in these facilities for 14 days before the onset of illness. And apparently this is a different situation. So we'll concentrate on um, patients who are uh, uh, presenting from the community um, uh, to the hospital, uh, complaining of the symptoms of uh, pneumonia. There are certain risk factors that uh, predispose patients to have pneumonia. Um, as we said, extremes of ages in uh, the adult population, we are talking about older ages. Patients who have previous pulmonary diseases, COPD, asthma, lung fibrosis, bronchitis, other, other chronic respiratory illnesses, they are more at risk of having pneumonia. History of smoking per itself, even without any disease, is a risk factor for community acquired pneumonia. Presence of other comorbid conditions, prior use of antibiotics or misuse of antibiotics, alcohol abuse, diabetes, uh, liver, uh, kidney or uh, heart problems, 
presence of uh, HIV or immunosuppression, institutionalization, that means you are, um, uh, the patient uh, is coming from a long-term care facility, the presence of certain neurological problems like dementia, seizure disorder, cerebrovascular disease, and the socioeconomic class also um, points to multifactorial uh, causes and is a risk factor for community-acquired pneumonia. Those multiple risk factors include crowding, poor hygienic uh, conditions, um, malnutrition, uh, uh, etc. So when you are dealing with pneumonia, you, uh, this is not uh, the, this list is not the um, an exclusive list. This is the most common, but there are a lot of factors that it predispose patient to a certain microorganism. There are risk factors for certain microorganisms. <coughs> Um, and you should be aware of those. We will not go in, into the details, but if you see the, uh, yeah, and a few of them, uh, like COPD, patients can have uh, hemophilus influenza, strep pneumonia, moraxilla catarralis, uh, heavy alcohol use, there is high incidence of clepsilla pneumonia in addition to strep. Patient with cystic fibrosis or structural lung disease, bronchitis, uh, uh, pseudomonas is a problem. Uh, and sometimes staff uh, aureus. Uh, patients from certain geographic areas, here they are talking about the United States, um, and they included the Middle East because of the time of this uh, table was put. They were talking about the mers cov that appeared in Saudi Arabia. Um, in certain seasons, like in the late um, fall or winter and early spring, um, uh, influenza and para-influenza viruses can also be a cause of pneumonia. This is in the usual uh, conditions. We are not talking about the epidemic or the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. This is in the usual days. Um, again, this table uh, can point that certain um, microorganism can be associated with certain factors uh, in the history that um, uh, ca can uh, predispose the patient to have a pneumonia, and this pneumonia can be complicated with a lot of complications. I'll give you a few of these, but you need to read the whole table. Look at the, um, for example, the anaerobes. Um, the anaerobes are common when there is poor dental hygiene or, and a uh, high risk of uh, aspiration. Um, look for uh, example to the pneumocystis gerovitzi, which used to uh, to be uh, uh, named pneumocystis um, carinii pneumonia. Pneumocystis gerovitzi is the new name uh, with patients with immunosuppressive drugs and with AIDS. Uh, strep pneumonia and the chronic cardiopulmonary disease and following upper respiratory tract infection. So you need to read all this table and review it. Uh, you, you do not need to um, uh, memorize it uh, word by word, but you need to be aware of it because you will face certain factors um, uh, that will uh, point to a certain microorganism. So uh, how we diagnose pneumonia, as we said, we uh, start with the history and with the physical examination. And um, you should be aware that each symptom of pneumonia can can be included in the differential diagnosis of other um, uh, acute respiratory illness, whether bronchial asthma, PE, pulmonary edema, uh, uh, other parenchymal lung disease, lung cancer, etc. So you should be take the, the, the history carefully and you should combine the symptoms with each other. And you should always keep pneumonia as a possibility uh, even in, in, in the, if the patient has a pre-existing or known case of bronchial asthma, pneumonia, um, I mean uh, bronchial asthma, COPD, heart failure, or other chronic medical problems. Now, after you take a proper history and physical examination, uh, you should get an X-ray, and the X-ray uh, differentiates um, the acute bronchitis in which there is no radiological changes in the X-ray, even if the patient's coming with fever and productive cough. Uh, um, pneumonia, you should have at least one opacity. You can um, 
look at the pattern of the pneumonia, whether it's diffuse or lobular or lobar. If there are complications like pleural effusion, possibility of empyema or cavitary uh, lesions that point to lung abscess, or if there are masses, all of these can be seen in the X-rays and they are uh, uh, defining uh, factors how to treat each pneumonia. Uh, some people uh, la uh, like to, com uh, to combine cert uh, certain radiologic patterns with a specific uh, microorganism causing community acquired pneumonia. You can review this, but uh, this is not 100% um, uh, uh, pathognomonic. You, sh you should know uh, common presentations and common microorganisms and combine them together. Um, I'll give you an example here. There is a patient who presents with uh, a 64-year-old man who presents with a long history of alcohol abuse. He presents with six-week history of low-grade fever, productive cough. And this is a PA and lateral chest radiograph. If you uh, look at the X-ray carefully, you will see that the patient here is having a large cavitary lesion. And this lesion uh, uh, has an air fluid level and um, it may, need, uh, may not be that much apparent in the lateral chest X-ray. However, this points that the patient's having necrotizing pneumonia leading to lung abscess. And the risk factor, and usually this is caused by Klebsiella or staph. And uh, the, the clue is the alcohol abuse, the long-term history um, uh, of symptoms. As we said, the chest X-ray can point to certain complications like empyema, uh, multilobar involvement, pleural effusions. So uh, they are helpful. So what's after um, uh, history and physical examination? We need to uh, uh, put our priorities, uh, how to manage this pneumonia, because we need to do a workup to know the microorganism, but we should put the priorities. So the initial approach to the patient with a clinical diagnosis of pneumonia should be directed about starting or instituting the empirical treatment as soon as possible. There is a lot of uh, research that points that the uh, patients who need hospitalization, the first dose of antibiotics should be given um, uh, within the first six hours. Some may extend it to, to the 12 hours, but it's not acceptable to be extended beyond 12 hours, but should be given uh, uh, in the first six hours of presentation to the hospital. So most um, uh, institutions and the standard of care is to give the, uh, the first empirical antibiotic treatment in the emergency room. The, the, the thing that if you do not give it, you will uh, go into a lot of uh, delay um, until the patient gets admitted, gets transferred from the emergency room to the floor, gets received from the nurse in the floor, um, uh, and uh, put in his bed, uh, taking vital signs, sending the workup, uh, uh, asking for the antibiotic from the pharmacy, bringing the antibiotic from the pharmacy. All of these are factors that cause delay um, of uh, treatment. So you should institute your empirical treatment in the emergency room. The second factor is to assess the uh, severity of the infection. And uh, the decision that depends on this assessment is the need to hospitalize. And if the patient needs hospitalization, where to put the patient? In regular floor, in uh, intermediate unit, or in intensive care unit. And the last priority is to identify the etiologic pattern. Now, um, uh, a lot of research has been done how to assess the severity of pneumonia. Uh, one of the earliest uh, assessment uh, tools was um, the CARB uh, stratification, which depends on four factors, uh, as you see in the acronym CARB, C confusion, U, urea nitrogen more than 70 millimole per liter, uh, R respiratory rate more than 30, and blood pressure. Um, when the systolic is less than 90 and diastolic less than 60. And um, if you do not have any criteria, the research showed that the mortality rate is low, but if you have the four criteria, it's a lot of, um, um, uh, or the rate of mortality was high. Uh, 
this uh, uh, care stratification does not have all the factors because the patient may have zero, but he's severely hypoxic. So, uh, uh, or the patient is um, having other factors like the age. So the next step uh, uh, that the, the care was not, um, uh, or has a lot of drawbacks is that the age. So they changed the care to care 65 and they added the age and they did the new research and they show um, uh, the mortality, I'm not, uh, um, uh, uh, the numbers are not necessary to be memorized, but uh, the, uh, you just need to look at them to see that uh, uh, the more uh, risk uh, or the more score the patient gets on CARB 65, the more is the uh, mortality. Um, after that, um, a lot of classifications came. وأنا هون بصراحة عجبتني سلايد يعني أكثر من إنه بدي إياكم تحفظوها بس احفظوا إنه one classification after CARB came is the smart cup S systolic blood pressure M multi-lobar involvement A the albumin R the respiratory rate T the tachycardia C confusion O oxygen saturation less than 90 and P the pH of in the blood and again, you collect points and you see the risk factor, but you do not need to remember the smart cop in details. Um, yeah, a lot of um, uh, stratification ways after CARB 65 and smart cop, the Croxo, uh, REEA, ICU, and then um, the pneumonia severity uh, score, um, uh, which came in the post study, I will show you in the next slide. And even uh, lastly, the ITSA ATS criteria. Um, so this is the pneumonia severity index was, يعني, uh, when it came in the New England Journal of Medicine, everybody was happy about it because it took a lot of factors, including demographic um, uh, factors, uh, history uh, of comorbidities, the findings in the physical uh, examination, the findings in the uh, uh, laboratory studies and the radiological findings. And you take all of this and you collect no um, uh, points and you then you stratify according to the risk depending on the, the numbers. And the question came after that, who in the emergency room will have the time to do this risk detailed risk stratification. So it was apparently impractical. However, because of the usefulness of this port study and the comprehensive uh, nature of it, we encourage everybody to read it and to uh, uh, several times and keep repeating reading it because all the factors that are present in the, uh, the characteristic factors of those, those, those uh, scores. You do not need to calculate the, store, uh, the score. You need only to look at the factors because they will increase in, your, in the back of your mind the, uh, uh, the severity of your pneumonia. Um, after that came the it's a, uh, Infectious Disease Society of America and the American Thoracic Society in 2007. They came with the new guidelines and they put minor criteria, major criteria, the same way. However, now it's apparent that all those stratifications uh, are cumbersome. You need to know them, but you do not need to calculate them. You need to memorize the details of them. Be attention that, uh, or, or pay attention to the uh, individual points, but the judgment about the severity of pneumonia uh, uh, it's now apparent that it's a clinical judgment. One factor may tell you that this, this patient needs ICU, severe hypoxia, for example, severe hypotension, uh, patient who is having severe hypothermia, um, or uh, um, a patient who needs mechanical ventilation. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the clinical judgment is uh, the, the, the way that you should go. And the other factor in the decision to hospitalize the patient is uh, other uh, non-medical factors, like a patient who's coming from remote area and you cannot send him back uh, to that area because the risk that he will have relapse or he will have complications, 
because of the comorbidities he have, although he apparently he's doing well, sometimes you may elect to admit him. So after the history, the x-rays, and the decision to admit the patient after assessing the severity, you may need to do labs. And on the top of the, the, this is the sputum studies. Uh, uh, it's apparent, uh, there are a lot of studies that showed non-value of sputum uh, for a patient who's coming with mild community-acquired pneumonia and is being given oral antibiotic and sent home. However, uh, if the patient is admitted to the hospital, uh, it's preferred to get uh, sputum studies, gram stain and culture. And if there is suspicion of a certain microorganism like TB or fungal pneumonia, you get uh, also acid fast bacilli and fungal smears and cultures. You do, of course, uh, for a patient who's admitted to the hospital, complete septic workup, including blood cultures. And this is a gram stain. Um, in the past, used to be required to be done um, by the uh, resident in the floor. They used to um, give you the material and the microscope, and you decide from the uh, sputum. But now uh, it's being sent to uh, uh, microbiologists in the lab. Um, there are other tests that can be done. The serology um, uh, fallen out of favor because of the delay uh, that can happen in getting the uh, results. And uh, um, the results also do not point uh, uh, whether the patient is uh, currently um, in certain period. Uh, they do not differentiate between current infection and old infection. Uh, but they are still being used for um, uh, research uh, uh, studies. You uh, there are two commercially uh, available antigen tests so far uh, to detect pneumococcal and uh, legionella in the urine. We extensively use, um, uh, or we started to extensively use uh, polymerase chain reactions, especially in COVID-19. Sometimes you may need to, uh, after admitting of the patient, if the patient's not responding, you may need to do bronchoscopy and get secretions um, for uh, uh, analysis and culture uh, from the lower respiratory tract. And if there is a pleural fluid, uh, uh, you may need to do thoracentesis and pleural fluid analysis. Now, strip pneumonia, previously considered to be the leading cause of community-acquired pneumonia, in recent studies it has been found to account only for 5 to 15 of hospitalized patients uh, suffering from uh, community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, the rates of community-acquired pneumonia caused by strip and enterobacteria shear are increasing. Um, this is uh, a study uh, that's done by the CDC, it's the EPIC study. It showed that up to 62% of patients in this study, the cause was not known. Um, viruses was re uh, responsible for about one quarter of the bacteria. However, this study is um, uh, among uh, certain population and differs between one geographical area and uh, other area. So you should take the uh, uh, antibiogram in your uh, country as a leading how to deal with pneumonia. Um, you should also consider other microorganisms in the light of the patient risk factor, the severity of illness, and the presence of certain epidemics. Um, uh, patients with no comorbidity, you should consider mycoplasma, chlamydia, respiratory viruses. Those microorganisms used to be called the atypicals. And patients with comorbidities, as we said previously, you should consider uh, certain microorganisms depending on their um, comorbidities, Haemophilus influenza, chlamydia, uh, staph, and gram-negative bacilli. You should be aware of newly identified pathogens, hantavirus, and uh, metanumoviruses. Hantavirus appeared in New Mexico, uh, metanumovirus in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we all remember the H1N5, the avian flu, and the H1N1 uh, uh, epidemics. And um, uh, we recently identified community-acquired strains of MRSA, which used to be nosocomial um, uh, infection. 
and uh, newly identified pathogens are uh, uh, the uh, coronaviruses of uh, of course it appeared initially as SARS then the uh, wave of MERS-CoV and currently we are talking about COVID-19. So association of certain risk factors with pecu uh, peculiar organisms is important and I encourage you to read this slide repeatedly so that you will uh, decide the empirical anti biotech depending on the um, uh, uh, these certain risk factors. We will not go into the details uh, of these, but they are very important. Uh, yeah, I'll take an example. Patients with neutropenia are uh, uh, at risk of staph aureus, strep pneumonia, and intergram negative bacilli. Um, diabetics, staph and pneumonia, etc. Yeah, all of these factors are important. Now, the complications of uh, pneumonia can be uh, pulmonary, can be non-pulmonary. They are extensive, uh, as you see in this slide. Pulmonary, um, either pneumonia does not resolve or the uh, lung abscess can be formed, empyema. Uh, the patient can have respiratory failure, ARDS. And um, other uh, complications can also be um, illustrated. Bacteremia, sepsis, septic shock, respiratory failure, ARD, uh, failure, ARDS are very serious complications of pneumonia. Sometimes, as I said, uh, paralumonic effusions that can be developed into empyema or uh, lung abscess due to cavitation, lung necrosis. Um, in certain types of uh, pneumonias, uh, especially if the patient on positive pressure ventilation, there is high risk of pneumomediacin and pneumothorax, and of course, surgical emphysema. You can have other microorganisms, um, uh, other, org uh, other organs that can be affected by uh, pneumonia, like endocarditis, pericarditis. You can have hemolytic anemia. And of course, death is a complication. The two slides, and uh, uh, um, uh, I uh, got them from an old Arabic journal, uh, the Arab Journal of Medicine. Um, or they were taken as a courtesy from another journal. Um, yeah, you, you see uh, complication of pneumonia due to hematogenous spread uh, uh, and bacteremia. This can, uh, patient may have secondary meningitis, brain abscess, endocarditis, pericarditis, or septic arthritis, and pyelonephritis sometimes. Um, or he can have, uh, due to sepsis, um, uh, toxic uh, effects of bacteria and pneumonia leading to uh, multi-organ failure. Now, if, uh, uh, these are two slides from two separate uh, sources, but they are talking about non-resolving non or slowly resolving pneumonia. You should always review what you are doing. You should be um, uh, sure that the diagnosis is pneumonia because sometimes you uh, label somebody with pneumonia and tend to be a xenophilic uh, pneumonia or uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So you need to make sure that you are dealing with infectious pneumonia. You need to know uh, the appropriate um, um, uh, risk factors and uh, history factors that point to a certain microorganism because uh, um, uh, and you need to, do, to look at the studies you did. Um, uh, you need to um, make sure that you are giving the appropriate antibiotic in an appropriate dose. And if there is any resistance of that microorganism, if the patient is adhering to the antibiotics or uh, the antibiotics is not administered appropriately, if the patient is uh, in the hospital, uh, um, you can uh, look uh, for the presence of certain underlying problem. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, patient can have fever due to drug-induced fever. So you need to look into all these factors to make sure why the patient has lack of response to treatment and uh, the pneumonia is not resolving or slowly resolving. Of course, you should never forget in a certain population that the patient can have what we call post-obstructive pneumonia due to lung mass, lung cancer, and the patient is not responding um, because uh, uh, the mass is occluding the bronchus and there is um, uh, in, uh, apparently initial response, then relapse of the uh, 
uh, disease. Uh, and similar to this is the presence of focal uh, anatomical abnormality or foreign body in the airway. Now we come um, in brief to the uh, nosocomial pneumonia, which is um, divided into hospital acquired pneumonia and a subset of hospital acquired pneumonia is ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, hospital acquired pneumonia is the infection that develops mostly after 48 hours. Um, it occurs in the floors, but it is more common um, uh, 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 but, but I mean the risk is uh, more in a patient uh, uh, who are on mechanical ventilation um, and uh, usually ventilator associated pneumonia starts 48 hours after the uh, mechanical ventilation يعني مش اللي حطيت مريض على ventilator بعد 8 ساعات أو 12 ساعة لقيت عنده نمونية تقول هاي ventilator associated pneumonia should be uh, he should have the ventilator for at least 48 hours um, the pathogenesis include aspiration of oropharyngeal secretions or iatrogenic and cross infection الناس ما بتنفش عليها كويس مريض عنده infection بنقل لمريض تاني uh, and the patient is getting hospital acquired pneumonia um, Factors um, um, contributing to gram-negative and oropharyngeal colonization are important because aspiration of oropharyngeal secretions um, is the leading cause of hospital-acquired pneumonia, uh, and the leading microorganisms are gram-negative bacilli and staph aureus. Staph aureus, we uh, most commonly MRSA. Um, uh, but uh, in certain areas, we notice that gram-negative bacilli are predominant. In our hospital, we have more gram-negative bacilli than we have uh, MRSA. So the factors that are contributing to this gram-negative oropharyngeal colonization are the more severity of illness, more duration of hospitalization, judicious use of antibiotics, um, uh, elder uh, or older age, poor nutrition, or the presence of any intervention or foreign body, intubation, major surgery, invasive procedures, etc. Now, there is increased risk uh, in certain situations um, uh, of aspiration leading to hospital acquired pneumonia, as is in aspiration pneumonias. And this, um, we are talking about the risks of aspiration that are increased with abnormal swallowing or impaired gag reflex, it's increased in when there is altered consciousness or delayed gastric emptying or decreased gastric motility. Patients who are frequently hospitalized can have multiple factors of uh, those. However, patients who are not hospitalized and have any factor leading to this can present with aspiration pneumonia. We go back to the um, management guidelines. Um, uh, you remember that the um, you institute your empirical treatment, you assess the, uh, you admitted the patient based on the assessment of severity. Now you are waiting the uh, etiologic uh, pathogen and uh, this is um, how you treat the patient. We will not go into the, the details because this is, um, uh, keeps changing and uh, it depends on the antibiogram of um, uh, each area. But there is always difference between uh, outpatient and inpatient treatment. There is also a difference uh, if you are treating the inpatient into a floor or um, uh, in ICU. If there is a consideration of certain microorganisms, certain viral pneumonia like H1N1, you should always include oseltamivir. Um, uh, and if there is a factor that you think of uh, uh, gram positive or staff, you should include staff coverage. And if the patient is at risk of pseudomonas pneumonia, uh, you, uh, you need to include anti-pseudomonal uh, antibiotics. This is the it's a, uh, ATS recommendation for empirical antibiotic treatment. We said that if the patient is outpatient with certain epidemiologic factors, there is, uh, you should think of those microorganisms. And this is the regimen that, um, this is the regimen that you should uh, use. Um, again, if the uh, patient is uh, in, uh, admitted to the floor, um, uh, there are certain recommendations uh, different from when the patient is in ICU. Um, you should always refuse, this is from Mixab um, 
uh, I think 18, Mixab 18, and it keeps changing, but uh, it has similar uh, yani, uh, uh, basis. Um, if the patient has any risk factors for um, uh, gram positives or gram negatives, you should consider coverage. Uh, so this is very important uh, slide. So um, you need to review it several times, but do not use exactly what's there unless you are reviewing the antibiogram of your areas and you see that they are consistent. I'll give you an example. Um, in outpatient treatment, we used to use microlides in Jordan, um, but uh, uh, a certain study was done, um, I think, in the Jordan University, um, points that we have a high microlide resistance a few years ago, and uh, that we have um, uh, oral penicillin like uh, amoxicillin more uh, useful. I don't know what's the condition now, but it, this keeps changing. Um, the, the fluoroquine loan, for, for example, the uh, um, uh, respiratory fluoroquine loans, um, the uh, resistance to fluoroquine loans um, has been changed um, uh, uh, by increasing resistance. So uh, if you stop using certain antibiotic, after a period you will get, uh, again, sensitivity to it. So. Um, we will not ask you about specific antibiotic treatment because this keeps changing. Now comes the last slide, which is how you prevent antibiotics. Of course, if there are modifier, modifiable risk factors, um, you need to modify them, control your diabetes, control your comor uh, the comorbidities of the patient. And of course, if the patient's a certain risk, you should get vaccination. We advise everybody to get influenza vaccination and uh, for certain population pneumococcal uh, vaccine and of course now the talk is about COVID-19. About influenza vaccination you make sure that um, it is uh, this keeps changing every year so if in this year you need to get the 2021 vaccine whether you are getting uh, Vaxigrip or Influvac or any other type of vaccination. Thank you for listening and please call me for any questions. Thank you.